welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to the Free Cities podcast, episode number 23. I'm recording this intro in a town called Bar in Montenegro. I'm here visiting the intentional community of Montelibro, interviewing people and finding out as much as I can about this intriguing project. I'll be releasing those podcasts in the not too distant future, along with some other excellent conversations that I had in Lisbon at LibertyCon a few days ago. All that's to come. But today I'm speaking with a gentleman by the name of Chris Caletta. Now, I met Chris in Warsaw and our discussion ended up being one of my favourites from that trip. Chris is a digital nomad and technologist who is, amongst other things, doing some absolutely fascinating postgraduate research on virtual libertarian communities. Our conversation touches on many aspects of his work, from digital politics to emerging governance models, and the part I found most interesting, the contemporary phenomenon of online communities manifesting in real life. Chris has been a keen observer of the Free Cities movement since the start, so he has a lot of great insights into the future of what people are calling the emerging free market of living together. Thanks for listening today. It's incredibly inspiring for me to watch our listener numbers growing steadily. Don't forget to reach out to us if you have any ideas or suggestions for the podcasts. I'd love to hear your opinions. And in the meantime, just sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Chris Caletta. Right. Let well. Why don't we start with um, where you come from first? Like, All right. How do you? How did you end? Because uh, am I getting this right? So currently. Do you, are you kind of no, of no fixed abode? Are you a proper digital nomad? Are you are you place to place? Or? Yeah, I mean, the last time when I had a proper um, address was a pandemic, and uh, I started my PhD in England, and uh, and I've been living in Manchester by then. So that was the last time when I had a well an address. So some of the some some of the institutions are still sending letters there, but that was you know what three years ago. Uh, before that, I was living. Uh, well, in, I was living in Manchester for for let's say about a year, and before that, in London for a few months. But before that, I've been almost three years in in both Americas, and uh, I've tried to <clears throat> to to find myself in Central America. I've been living in the US for a while, and uh, uh, in South America as well. And then before that, around 2015 was the last time when I actually had a real address and real well, can't say home, but sort of a house that I've been living in. Can I ask you, is the reason for this kind of lifestyle ideological or is it... Because I travelled a lot when mm. I was a kid, probably... I mean, I think that my first trip was almost two years. But I had no reason to travel other than I just wanted to see the world. Uh, I think possibly now there are, and certainly I'm getting that sense from you, there are other reasons to travel to be of no fixed abode or to be moving and so so what's your reason there are two reasons one is um the very idea of traveling the the very idea of crossing the border and you know understanding what is the border how to cross it uh, how to meet someone on the other side um there was this famous polish writer uh richard kapuscinski who uh who who was focusing on the idea of the other, of someone who is unknown, someone who is far away from you. So, you know, one of the things that I've been looking, um, you know, after when I started traveling was that um, I wanted to meet that other. You know, I wanted to 
cross the border, whatever the border was. Was you know was that the country border or the cultural border? Anything that you know that was building sort of like a barrier to cross over. And I wanted to you know cross that and then meet these people, talk to people, learn a new language, learn something about the culture. And uh, and that crossed over with the very thing that happened in the last thirty years, which is the digital revolution. And you know, once the once the internet um, became more accessible in Poland, which was pretty much the same time as you know all over all over, all over Europe, so like uh, I'll say mid to late nineties, um, I've started looking after things online. So, you know, like when I was a kid, I had a map open and I was just like trying to travel from like from Poland to Africa. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, one day I'll end up in Ghana or like in Kenya. But um, but with Internet, I could type in Ghana or Kenya to, you know, Google uh, or like back then Yahoo or any other, you know, browser search engine thing that was, you know, happening back in the early 2000s. And he was showing me actual photos of this place. And I, you know, I've read loads of books. I've been reading, you know, like uh, a few books weekly, you know, on, uh, on on various topics. And and it was bringing me closer to, well, understanding that there are other things around the world. So the internet was the second thing that was pushing me over and, you know, giving me idea that there there are spaces. It's not a single space that we, I mean, it is a single space we're living in. But it's not, you know, categorized, it's not close, bonded, it's just uh, that we are closing our, ourselves to, you know, not experience certain things because we only speak Polish, we, we only live in Poland, we, we never cross, uh, you know, to, to, to talk to all the lady in, uh, in some village outside of your town and so on, so... I don't know if that answers your question. But, it, but it, it more than answers my question. Um, I mean, I, I suppose what I'm trying to find out is um, because I, you, you mentioned you're certainly a libertarian, whatever that means. I mean, there's, you know, we'll come to that almost yeah. certainly. But um, there is a, obviously a connect between being a inverted commas libertarian and wanting to travel. I presume, in particular, because of the practical implications of it. Um, you know, a, a, an expat living in a foreign country, for example, mm-hmm. is much harder to govern, in my experience, it, because you're, you know, yeah. you're a foreign a foreigner there. Even even getting stopped by the police for you know for some reason, often, you know, it, 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 it's happened that they'll look at you and go, oh, you know, what am I going to get here? So, so whatever, you know, if it's not, you know, if it's not I, I a minor actually, offense or something. I actually have a British driving license and in Europe, uh, if you have a British driving license, if it's the first time that they see you, uh, they usually, they are like, oh, you're from Britain. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, okay. And I was driving a British car in Europe some, some time ago. Uh, I think it was two years ago and it was already after Brexit. And uh, I've learned that they are not sending any tickets to to Britain because there there is no mutual agreement uh, in between the EU and uh, and uh, Great Britain after Brexit. So quite literally, I was driving. I got some tickets somewhere in France, and uh, and some guy was like, "No, you don't have to care. Mm. They're gonna send it, and it's just gonna be you know." Gone. So but, uh, so then is that so is that a part of the reason why you like the lifestyle then? Well, I mean. So when I'm saying I'm a libertarian, it's a kind of uh, complicated term that has all the baggage, you know, all the um, social perception of what it is and what it brings to the table, especially when we're talking with like American friends or like Anglo-Saxon friends in general. They are thinking libertarianism, they are having some sort of figures in their heads. But it's... Um, it's a philosophical umbrella of, of, of sort of a pursuit in life, social pursuit. You know, you, you, you have a certain feeling that something is best in life. It might be something that you aim at. It might be something that you believe would be best for the society or societal organization or uh, for the economic organization of, uh, of, of people and so on. So my libertarianism is mostly this aim or a goal of sort that you know that human can be uh, living in a society organized without the state uh, in a purely anarcho-capitalist society, and I believe that would be the best organization of uh, of humans. 
but it doesn't mean that I'm walking around you know towns and and uh, you know streets in Warsaw t- telling people that they have to stop paying taxes and uh, and withdraw from all the you know public activities because it doesn't have any sense. So in my life, I'm trying to pursue some sort of libertarian activities. So for instance, teach some of my friends of how to be a responsible person, uh, how to be individualist in in understanding of the concept of the umbrella of individualism, which is being not only responsible for your own actions, but, you know, <clears throat> understanding that other people are responsible for theirs, <clears throat> finding the ways to kind of, you know, balance the things in between in between people and entities. And, um, and it means sometimes that I need to explain how things are working in economic, uh, economic sense, how certain uh, cultural shifts or, or societal shifts that are happening right now all, all over all over the world in, in in each department of the of the you know um, of the of the human life that they have some roots and try to help them understand the roots. I'm not I'm not saying that I have all the answers, but I'm usually digging deeper to understand what is happening around the world, and it is from my sort of uh, standpoint of a, of a libertarian that I perceive uh, things slightly differently than mainstream media, for instance. But it doesn't mean that I'm one of these, you know, uh, burn up, f- uh, uh, fighting sort of um, uh, libertarian fight. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of, uh, I'm always calling myself a, a an umbrella libertarian who believes in sort of like a progress. So at this point, I'm probably more of a classic liberal in a, in a way of like what I believe is possible around us. But I believe that there is a certain point of human development that we end up with be- like a better organization of, uh, of humans. So that's, uh, that's just to explain that. So I guess, uh, you know, coming back to, to what you've been saying, um, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm 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 just listening. I suppose what I'd like to know, and I mean, obviously, I'm interested in your take on free cities because, oh yeah, um, you know, I see a big um, connection between people, digital nomads, yeah. and the free cities movement. There, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Um, but I'm also very interested in the actual nuts and bolts of being a digital nomad. And yeah. I actually think a lot of people are. Um, I was an analog nomad. Oh, yeah. uh, I traveled, when I left university, I traveled for about three years. And then on and off, um, I've been traveling most of my life, really. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but if we'd have had, we didn't even have access to email when I traveled. We had yeah. post restal. I don't know whether people still use that now. Do you know what that is? No, no clue. Never heard of it. No. Rather, that? you're showing your age. post restal was the only way we could contact. So I, I, I began traveling mainly around Southeast Asia, and Singapore was, was a, a hub in Southeast Asia because there was a lot to the north of it and a lot to the south of it, you know. Um, and the only way you could communicate with your friends was by s- writing a letter Sending it to the central post office and writing their name, post restaurant, you know. Yeah, and the short message only. No, no, no. You could, you could, you could put it in an envelope. You could write a huge letter. You just wrote um, Uh, Chris Coletta. No, uh, Chris Coletta, post restaurant, Singapore. Oh, okay. And you put it, put a stamp on it, put it in a in a in a post box, and it would arrive at Singapore post office and go in a a special box, which is the post restaurant box. And then whenever you were traveling through, you know, I used to travel through. Singapore once every sort of six months probably you go to this box and you just flick through and you look for your letters and all central post offices around the world had this thing which it which when I think about it now I mean how far we've come is quite astonishing what it did do though which is I mean because I travel now as a digitally obviously like you do um it did I I did find traveling back then far more romantic Mm-hmm. You know, when I went to, you know, Bangkok, it was like walking into another world. And and you knew you were about to not have contact with your family for a year or two. So you were just mm-hmm. gone. Whereas now, obviously, you bring home with you, which is which is also a positive, obviously, because now you can literally, you can bring your business with you. You can bring everything with you and you you can 
live on the road, which is obviously what you're doing. So, so I'd like to, let's start with the nuts and bolts of being a digital nomad then. Um, you know, for, actually, before I ask, what did you study at university, by the way? You said you were studying in Manchester, is that right? So, yeah, I graduated from Manchester, Liv- uh, sorry, uh, Leicester and London, and then previously from Krakow and Porto. Oh, so not Manchester, sorry. And Manchester, so I'm, f- uh. I'm finishing my PhD in Manchester right What's now. your PhD on then? Uh, on the Polish virtual libertarians. And the so Polish the- virtual libertarians? Yes. So that sounds very 21st century. <laughs> so basically it's digital politics. It's not a PhD in politics or in um, internet because there, there, there is no department of internet. And if there is, there is uh, more of a programmist sort of technological sort of aspect of things. And I'm studying the social things of, uh, of technological developments. So I'm studying the the impact that the technology had on the creation and development and maintenance of the the community of Polish libertarians, which happened, of course, in the virtual context. Cause wow, that's interesting. So, yeah. bec- well, that, that really is interesting because that's something I think about a lot. And in particular, that virtual communities mm-hmm. are now manifesting physically, yes. which is I've seen with my own eyes has happened to me. It's mm-hmm. happening to us right now, literally. You know, like I only know you through the internet. Uh, it's pretty much it's a phenomenon that um, that happens all over the world, and most of the people are still thinking um, of the virtual uh, as the realm that is outside of our physical living, which isn't a case any longer. To be frank, you know, from the from the nineteen eighties when the the first concepts of the the, the the communities that are in the head or sort of uh, uh, imagined communities uh, when it was created it had sort of a logical explanation back then because it was only you know people who were uh, familiar with computers and uh, and phones who could you know create some sort of a community but over time like I would say even in 2000s it became to sort of uh, you know uh, amalgamate with each other. So at some point, you know, in, in 2010s, it wasn't any different than any, any other community. And nowadays, you know, we are we are going to meet on the on one of the bol- biggest Polish events of, um, of uh, you know, libertarian, classic liberal uh, community. And most of these people met online. Most of the, the people in there are still communicating on a daily basis online. The online is as natural as you know, getting out of uh, of, of your house and uh, getting you know a, a public transport or your car, getting back to the city, town, whatever, it's exactly the same process. So you're getting a bus to get from your place to to the center of the town. But if you want to write to your mum or to your friend, you're just writing over the the virtual. But also you're performing your business over the virtual. You're uh, controlling your finances over, over over the virtual, you're doing pretty much every other aspect of your living via the virtual. I mean, you know, people are going for the for the gym for for yoga sessions and so on, and they are opening their apps to learn how to do certain things. They are, you know, uh, going to buy a bagel and they're paying with, uh, well, hopefully at some point with Bitcoin, but uh, at this point they are paying with uh, with money and uh, uh, you know via the phone or via via the car. Or via the watch, whatever. So, of course, you know, the virtual is just a, a, a sort of a addition to our previous solely physical world. And, of course, that's a, that's extremely interesting. That's, that, that's how I started to, uh, to, to study that, to, to, you know, get interested in that. But to, to answer your previous question, I, stu- I studied before political science, international relations and economics. And... Uh, and I, I was studying in Poland and then in England, uh, and in the meantime in Portugal. And it sort of started my traveling, uh, you know, uh, needs. But um, but I couldn't find myself comfortable with any of these disciplines because uh, I never actually thought. Well, I was thinking when I was eighteen that I will pursue the academic career. But when I started studying and I saw all these, you know older gentlemen reading through books and never actually being down to earth of uh, to what you know what is happening all around us with uh, you know the digital revolution that was already happening in the mid 2000s 
I realized that it's not my life and I can't spend my life in academia because it's 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 completely different than what I actually want in life. I can't spend my life sitting 50, 60 hours a week in one single building teaching people who don't want to listen about things and being, you know, pushed to teach certain areas of, uh, of you know, say, politics or, or sociology. Uh, I decided to, you know, to to find a job and uh, to start traveling instead. And then at some point uh, I figured out that, you know, the, the times are now. So um, I, I figured that I can pursue my PhD virtually. Uh, here's a question then, because <clears throat> I, I stopped at, um, uh, um, I, I never did a master's or a PhD or anything yeah. like that. Um, but for example, what you're studying as a, in a PhD is fascinating to me. I, I could do that all day. How do you, how does that work? Like, what do you do? Go to a university and say, "Hey, I really want to study," you know, this the, you know, the, how digital libertarians are f- forming communities around the world. I don't know what, what, so, what, and they say, "Yeah, sure, here's some money, go and do it." What? <laughs> so I've um i've been looking for something like that all around the world and um, in england there was only cambridge university that was running the cambridge analytica sort of team so people interested in scandals social media data you know stuff that are extremely interesting but still not my you know first pursuit so not sort of my first focus on uh, what i want to want what to want to do in the academic uh, world and they opened in uh, in manchester they opened just opened uh, the call for for PhD students on digital politics. Uh, I've written to these um, to these. Uh, Hold doctor. a minute. I've got to ask you, what is digital politics? Though? Digital politics is basically the the polit- So the politics is that everything that happens in the political sphere, which is basically the social life. So everything that happens in social life that relates to politics and politics is the basically not maybe not the fight, but sort of. Uh, a conflict of a power distribution. But like so digital in poli- the digital context is just adding a context of the virtuality on top of that. But like you don't mean like the way that politicians use the digital world to further their... It might so be. It, it could might. be. So it, it is basically everything that relates to the politics and digital world. Okay. So if you, if you would, you know, ask questions that are focusing on the political groups, that fits there. But if you ask question about Cambridge Politica, uh, sorry, Cambridge Analytica influence over the the elections in the U.S., you've got the same, you know, the same space. You might also ask about, you know, the the uh, sort of development or, or extreme popularity of populisms from you know both sides of the of the spectrum that happens because of social media, and that also fits there. So it's pretty much you know the umbrella that previously was working under the politics, uh, sociology, cultural studies, and technology disciplines. And it's a multidisciplinary uh, in, in its, you know, in its... In so itself. who, when you do something like this, mm-hmm. when you're funded to do a PhD on something like this, who's interested in your research? So, you know, of course, I don't know yet. Once, uh, once I'm published, you know, with the, with the results, I'll see who is, uh, who is going to be uh, interested. What would you in imagine outside. would be? I assume there is loads of groups that might be interested in that. There is um, certainly people who are interested in virtual communities per se. So, you know, all the people who are actually interested in what the virtual community is, how it is created. So because I do something that is called episodic narrative inquiry, which is a method um, of uh, narrative studies, and I'm talking to people, building a narrative study of the virtual community, trying to um draw on board how they experienced the creation and the maintenance or the, the, the progression of the community. This is like an insight of how the virtual communities function in general. What was the uh, the way, I mean, what was the process that was making them belong to that community and so on. So that's one aspect of things, you know, that um, um, that because of the uh, because of the of that knowledge, people who are interested in virtual communities might understand the the process in inso- the processes inside of these uh, of, of of the virtual and the community. The second side uh, side of that is that there is plenty of people who are interested in populisms 
and the extremisms in in a in a contemporary political sphere or space. And of course, libertarianism is one of these. It's extremism uh, as understood by public. So, of course, for most of the people, they believe that libertarianism is something that is of the chart. Is what? Sorry. Of the chart. Oh, off the chart, right? Yeah. Right. So. In, 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 such a, in such a case, I'm explaining, not me, the, the people that I was uh, you know, talking to, they are explaining how they are libertarian, what drives them there, what was the reasons that bec they became libertarians. And uh, there's plenty of these. There is you know, things that, that relate to their own uh, familial histories. So you know, one, of the, one of my interviewees... Uh, uh, chatted about her family having a tragic um, experiences with, uh, well, the communist regime, and her having a very upsetting uh, experiences abroad in the in uh, international education sort of space, and uh, she was saying that it was driving her to some community that was against, you know, the communist, uh, uh, say, propaganda or. or the communist space in the public uh, that is happening all around the academia nowadays. And she decided to become a libertarian afterwards, you know, and uh, there, there, there are some other people who are saying that they were driven there because of the right-wing uh, sort of uh, populist uh, slash libertarian in his mind uh, a politician who is Corvin Mika. And they were saying that, uh, you know, they listened to him when, when they were teenagers and they were extremely... Um, interested or fascinated by his ideas and uh, the way he was, you know, shaping the the reality in, with his narratives. And uh, and they said that at some point they start the reading through the you know sources and they find out that uh, they found out that you know Corbyn's uh, ideas are well far away from what actually he's talking about. So when he's talking about some social perception of how so, uh, you know society should look like they start the reading through Rothbard through Rand and so on they figure that you know he's just kind of like a mixing completely different and opposite uh, political ideas and they started to become more libertarian uh, oriented and uh, so yeah so of course um, uh, you know these 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 stories are brought together they are giving you a great view over the or overview of you know who these people are why they became libertarians and there are people like you for instance guys you might be interested in uh, in the crowd who is actually looking for something in the contemporary world the contemporary market of ideas and what is driving them what makes them uh you know get interested or be interested in certain concepts and ideas and how they can pursue that in the in the future. So for instance, if they are interested in free market ideas, are there ways to create something like uh, another free city or, or some sort of like a space where they where get where they can realize their their needs within, you know, say a short distance from Poland, or where, will they be sort of willing to relocate somewhere else with their businesses, with their activities and so on. So I assume, you know, this is giving the plenty of like a basic data that of course, you know, it's a, it's not a volume study. study. So it, it, it won't give you, you know, massive numbers per, per understanding of like how certain th people will act in certain situations, but it gives you plenty of insights of how particular people were, you know, choosing or deciding over of the lifespan uh, and what drives them to, towards, you know, these, these views. Have you, in your research, <laughs> have you come across anyone that's been moving, you know, geographically to, to be able to live a, a more freer life, say? I would say, um, without numbers, uh, yes. Uh, not a massive number, but... Uh, most of them actually moved in between areas within Poland because it's easy, once again, coming back to what I said earlier on, it's much easier to sort of uh, navigate your life if you know the culture, if you know the language, if you know the setting. But some of them went abroad. And by abroad, I mean not only by getting from Poland to Germany or England, uh, but getting outside of what is known for most of the students in Poland and uh, they started pursuing their careers, you know, summer. So like in the US, in, in European Parliament and so on. And uh, and I guess, you know, 
not all of them, or maybe not sing, not single one of them is like me, digital nomad. But I don't know that many people who are actually willing to become a digital nomad with, uh, you know, all the ups and downs that it that it has. Into it. Sure, I mean, I I agree with you there. I, I think especially as you get a family, mm-hmm. I suppose I'm more interested in whether or not the the concept of moving to a different jurisdiction mm-hmm. with um, you know, is is something that crosses anyone's mind. I mean, for for myself and everyone I talk to, because I'm kind of in this world, it's quite a common concept yeah. that it's something that's beginning now. I mean, it's been around forever, I suppose, but it's um, the concept of free jurisdictions is is gaining momentum, and I think it's partly because it's a response to you know authoritarianism, mm-hmm. but I think it's also to do with the internet i mean 30 years ago how did you know anything about anything like when you when you consider the internet now now um i found out about free cities i found out about libertarian ideas i found out about classic you know classical liberalism any of these things i found out about Mm -hmm. all of them online Mm -hmm. and then it, it manifested in real life i now find myself sitting across a table with you in warsaw um I've never been to Poland before. I've never met you before. You know, we've had a bit of to and fro on the internet and suddenly bang, it's manifesting. Same yeah. goes for, you know, free cities in Honduras. You know, I was editing a podcast yesterday, last night, of a family from Sweden who live in Prague who've just bought an um, an apartment with Bitcoin in Prospera in Honduras. Now, a side note, now, this, a side note I was living in Utila, which is next island, for a few months back in 2018. And did you did you hear about Prospera? Yeah, of course. Did you go and visit by any chance? No, because uh, it was off my budget back then. Right. Because, uh, you know, living as a digital nomad has its downs. Sure. <laughs> Budget-wise. But, but is it something you come across? Like, of, yeah. So I've heard of the, of the concept from the very beginning. I mean, uh, I've heard plenty of... Uh, uh, people online were chatting about such a concept. You know, it started with the um, with the sea standing projects, and uh, you know, the, they were pursuing some sort of space outside of the the jurisdiction of uh, of the US, of of Europe, and so on. So, of course, you know, when I heard that, I was like, I'm, I'm extremely interested in that. But uh, and I can answer your question that wasn't yet, you know, um, asked. I believe that there is certain time that people will start moving or shifting towards that idea. And that comes with the stability. So most of the libertarians in Poland are in the mid-30s. I would say some of them will start thinking about some sort of like progression or allocation when they are a little bit older or when their kids will have you know enough of the Purchase, purchasing power to move abroad. And that might come with Bitcoin uh, revolution, evolution. We'll see how it goes. It might come with, uh, with uh, uh, well, changing of the, of the systems in, in Europe or in the US and so on. Um, but I might add one more addendum to what you've been saying. And uh, when, we, when we saying that the internet has been impacting the probability and the uh, popularity of a concept like a free free cities and uh, when we are asked or when I'm asked what will be happening with free cities concept in the idea in the in the next uh, few years or in the ne- uh, near future I would say the most important is that the internet is shaping and changing the um, the various known feelings such as belonging, such as the origins, such as who I am, what I am, what I am for, for most of the youngest, uh, youngsters uh, around the world. And of course, there are very <clears throat> negative, very, uh, you know, many of the negative uh, aspects of, 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 of these, you know, changes, say TikTok and the algorithm of uh, uh, of um, the, the algorithms that they are using to kind of shape the, the political social perception of uh, certain uh, targets in different markets, uh, uh, the way that uh, social media in general is uh, oversimplifying uh, messages and content and so on. But uh, 
But over time, in the next, I would say, 10 to 15 years, we will see a complete change of what it means to be a human in a, in a society. Because nowadays, for instance, in the UK, if you're living in London, you still, you still feel that you belong to the city of London and to the Great Britain, United Kingdom, Europe, whatever, whoever is having so, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, family and educational sort of uh, roots, they are having these views. But the process of socialization and the, you know, the process that you're having when you're learning about the world, what it comes with the social responsibility, with uh, you know, the creation of uh, uh, what we are doing in the society in general, right now is heavily influenced by the digital. Mm. Most of the kids, if not all of the kids, are actually on their devices doing loads of things at once. <clears throat> They're actually more capable of uh, doing you know digital things uh, than most of us digital people who were you know living in in digital era for for like 30 years or something it is changing the the information uh, the, the the focus of the brain on information how you access information how you process information and so on so in the next 10 15 years when the next generation or one and a half generation will be on the say market they want this. They won't feel the same belonging to London, to uh, to Tottenham, to uh, to certain football club, to a certain pub that they be, belong. You know, by uh, by familiar sort sort of uh, sort, sort of roots. They will start feeling much more connected with people online, with people who are sharing the same interest, because it will become more important for them than. You know what we have in a in a physical now. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I, 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 that's already happened to me. That has actually yeah. happened to me already. I wouldn't even say it's ten, fifteen years away. I mean, um, my children are too young to be online at the moment. But mm -hmm. for me personally, and the the what kick started it for me was the pandemic when yeah. suddenly I went online. That was the first time I really went online for real. Mm -hmm. Zoom. I can remember my first my first mm -hmm. Zoom call thinking this is a bit weird, you know, look how far we've come. Yeah. But since that point, my relationships have all switched to online. Yeah. It was, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, one of the most phenomenal applications of the internet, I think, yeah. is you switch it on, you, you plug into it, and, and you get to connect with people that, that share your interests. And that doesn't happen in real life. I mean, it's... No. Um, but, okay, was it, so... Maybe then I'm, I'm just I'm just throwing this out there. Maybe that the free cities idea um, is of this moment because um, we have this opportunity to manifest our physical ideas. Sorry, our, our, our online ideas mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. and there was never. I mean, obviously, the the, the option to 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 start a new jurisdiction was always available. Mm. But with this newfound um, uh, concentration of online communities mm. looking for physical representation, mm -hmm. um, maybe, I don't know, what do you think about that? Is, it, is, is, am I, is that conjecture or do you think that could be it? This could be the time from this moment in history that, that this is going to start happening. And when it starts happening naturally people are going to be looking to maybe create their own regulations to maybe um you know get a bit of autonomy you know but they've already got autonomy online they, they have this mm -hmm. supreme autonomy you know like especially if they're using encrypted messaging or whatever they're just mm -hmm. like whoever um what do you think they will build a marketplace of ideas and they just implement it all over the world that was my point with my previous uh message is that once the sort of brain and the focus is changing the possibility of uh, implementation of such a project is, you know, growing, and it's it's natural because what Free Cities, I mean, from Free Cities is, is that it brings over the idea of freedom of choice, which do, which doesn't, you know, exist in a contemporary society. When you think right now uh, of uh, a completely average random person who is pursuing his uh, entrepreneurial uh, sort of uh, business ideas in 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 say Poznan in Poland. They are 
uh, they want to be as far from the administration of the public administration as possible. They want to just run the business, do whatever is needed, get back home and uh, spend some time with, uh, with their wives, husbands and so on. At this point, they are not interested in changing anything because they don't see a logic in that because it's too complicated. It's, it's a massive project that requires loads of resources and uh, loads of thinking organization and so on. It's too much to invest. Over time, it will change. So, you know, the uh, sort of the entry level to projects like Free Cities will be lowering with time. And at some point, people will not try to blend with the, with the normal in the society. They will try to blend with the non-normal in the society. And it happens, of course, right now with ideas like, uh, you know, the social perception of who, who we are as humans. So you have loads of people who are believing in completely different uh, ways of manifesting themselves. So it happens on that level. Sorry, like what? what like, for instance... Uh, they, uh, th there is loads of people all around the world who believe that uh, uh, we need to re-evaluate or sort of re-identify ourselves. So if we are living in a society, maybe there is a different uh, perception of what gender is and so on. So, of course, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I understand most of that, but I understand that these people are following a certain process. And it's natural that, you know, with the opening of the world of information that is Internet... People are starting exploring ideas. And it, you know, it usually happens that the ideas are first explored on the social level or on the cultural level even more. So you're exploring, for instance, uh, your passion for like uh, uh, aggressive music and you're becoming a fan of punk rock, of uh, metal, death metal, grindcore, whatever. And that brings you to, you know, a certain community of people who are following the same, you know, uh, passion for, say, punk music or grindcore music. And these people usually share some interests outside of music. Not all of them, but some of them will share that. And they will start sharing them more over time. And with internet, of course, you know, it happens that, you know, the cultural level or the so sociocultural level of, uh, of uh, you know, changes is happening already. But, you know, with time, that will you know, that will come over to political and economical uh, sort of perception of what reality is. And then, only then, we'll start to have more interest in, in projects like Free Cities. Go on then. According to what you know currently from study, life, experience, if you follow the timeline of your thinking into the future, what does the world look like in 100 years? Hmm. We are living on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, All right, what does the Earth look like in a hundred years? I have two scenarios in my head, and um, it's uh, it's extremely dependent on the next few years, I guess. Um, I just, uh, I'm waiting for one of my papers to be published that uh, tries to analyze the two models of the internet in the next, uh, say, 10 years onwards. One model is the model of... Um, I'm calling it um, the sovereign internet. Sovereign internet are the internets of the nation level uh, administration. So, for instance, you have a Russian internet, Runet. You have a Chinese internet. You have a Singaporean internet. You might have a Hungarian internet and so on. These internets are basically limited to a certain level of access that is uh, decided by the administrative uh, groups. But basically you mean access to information? Access to everything. Online. Oh, okay. Inter so the internet as we know it now, exactly. shopping, so, information. So when we what? think internet, there are two levels of internet. You have the infrastructural level of internet and you have what you see on the desktop on your browser uh, on your, uh, you know, uh, wrist and so on, on your yeah. smartphone. So it's basically what we see as the face, sort of face of the of the internet. But infrastructure is what is actually important. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what is the most important. So if you have a control over the infrastructure, you might turn off the the, the connection on the, the possibility of accessing certain um, areas of the contemporary internet. So imagine that Runet, for instance, is turning off all the 
foreign uh, platforms, everything. So they only allow for the internet to exist within the Russian borders. And of course, that's that you know that requires certain cuts in a, on an infrastructure level because you know the the, the wires that are connecting uh, uh, things, the servers are connected and so on. But it's not that you know far from reality as it is. You know, Russia is already banning several platforms from uh, operating on the market. I'm not talking about China because it's a it's a complete you know different level of uh, of how they actually control the the infrastructural level of uh, of the internet. But that's one reality. And that's what we're facing right now, also in Europe, because you know European uh, Parliament is uh, pro- uh, you know progressing towards more control over the internet and over the infrastructure of the internet. And uh, I wouldn't be shocked if the next in the if in the next few years they will be pushing towards uh, well basically the European internet that will be connected with other internet such as American uh, internet or like American Canadian and uh, and rest of the world, but as they like it. So, for instance, that Google, uh, Facebook, and so on won't have a power of building their own companies as they like. In here, they would be uh, pushed to create that accordingly with the European Union, uh, European Union regulations. So that's one vision. And the other vision is the decentralized, scattered type of network. So even more of a, of a, of original idea of how the internet should look like, so that the two entities or devices are communicating with each other and that actually expanded on the web 3.0 sort of uh, idea of infrastructure so that the devices that are communicating in between each other creating a completely decentralized network so if we are progressing 100 years from now i can see the two building two completely different societies and you, you might understand why because internet is ultimately it's the access to information and interaction, but uh, interaction is also a level of information in that uh, sort of scenario. So if you don't have intera- if you don't have access to information, sorry, to interaction with people, you can't access information on a personal level. So you will have only limited access to you know to what is uh, uh, green lighted by a certain public administration, and that's very scary. I can't. Uh, I can't think of a more scarier vision of uh, how the how the future can look like because what we have right now with internet is uh, is basically unprecedented in the history of human civilization. I don't think that that, that will be something as um, as free as it is, you know, as as massive in terms of what it brings to the humanity as it is. The scattered internet might have different visions as well, different forms. It might be still controlled by government's administrations on some level, but that isn't controlled by the state to the fullest, by the authority to the fullest. So it's still independent of what the political decisions are. So if you ask me about the 200, uh, sorry, 2100, I'm saying we are in the, either ending in the very Orwellian sort of uh, society, and that, by that I mean really Orwellian, like China today, but you know amplified, with you know the levels of uh, even a scores uh, on the on the I'm sorry citizen scores on the business scores on the cultural scores if you're not uh, saying hi to your neighbor you are having a minus point and this all you know all this uh, basically social engineering sort of level of uh, social credit. control so yeah social credit but it's also social engineering so you're actually aiming yes, at people yeah. behaving certain way yeah. and then you know of course you have the scattered. Uh, internet and that that can have like a normal future and in such a normal future i can see the future for uh, projects like uh, free cities well i I was just going to say that's the digital manifestation i what about the physical manifestation in a hundred years of of you know how i presume there's two ways of living i mean i'm going to guess one of them is this uh, sclerotic centralized authoritarian regimes mm-hmm. um, creating you know in cities presumably and, and the alternative I mean this is very sort of romanticized is small satellite places with autonomy I would assume that that vision would be probably the closest what to what will be um, the or the sort of like at a macro level of development of humans they will 
aim at lower level, smaller communities in the future because they are easier to control, they are easier to govern. Uh, so even if... Who, I'm, sorry, they. who do you mean by they will aim at? Humans. Yeah, okay, general. right, okay. And uh, when I'm saying Mars, I'm not that far from what I actually believe will happen. We'll get back to the ideas of actually living outside of the of this planet. And it will be that some, some people will stay here, some people will go there. And it's, it's inev- inevitable, in my personal view. It, there will be people like Musk or like uh, uh, Bezos who will be pushing t- towards, you know, going outside of here in many forms. So it might be in Mars, it might be this, the, the... But this um, this fork in the mm-hmm. humanities road then, is it binary? Is it is it one or zero? Or are these two things, um, can they coexist? So the, the two visions that I just uh, talked about, they are one to O. Uh, so in a binary vision, they are one to O, but there is space as in everything else in between. And of course, we can end up with like a scatter network that is controlled to the fullest by arteries and not the other way around. So the other is the extreme. But, you know, the I I personally believe that every, or, well, think based on what I read in my life and what I see in, in, in the society right now, that we are aiming or we are uh, having a pathway towards smaller societies in general, small communities in general. I don't know if that would be as it is imagined by many people. So it will, uh, it if it will, will end up with like, uh, you know, freer societies and so on. I don't think so. I think in many places that that's gonna be ending with like a more authoritarian sort of uh, control over certain areas, especially in places like. Uh, Certain areas of Africa, certain areas of uh, Latin America, which are always struggling with the power. Uh, so I assume that's going to be, you know, leading towards uh, sort of uh, feather, maybe federalization of a certain areas. But that also means that there will be people who will be pushing towards something like a space where they can realize themselves, where, where they can, you know, be themselves outside of these weird <laughs> scattered sort of uh, federalized uh, authoritarian uh, uh, areas and that's how I I perceive you know all the islands that are still either uh, you know inhabited or or uh, that are you know like sort of uh, still f- still not as maintained maybe that's the best way to put it and uh, still not as not not as maintained as the rest of the uh, of the continental sort of uh, areas so I would assume all the uh, region of uh, Caribbeans will at some point end up with being, you know, like uh, much more scattered than it is right now. I would say the same with like uh, islands on the um, North Sea and here in, in, in Europe. And uh, probably, you know, all these little islands will have much more, you know, people will have much more, much more focus on them to create some sort of communities in there that will follow the logic of free cities. Maybe not as free market as we wish, but... Uh, well, I mean, free market means free cities, which means anything. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, the, the the important notion is the opt in, exactly. The, the lack of coercion, you know. So, going back to your two, your binary outcome, mm-hmm. which I, I kind of agree. I certainly agree with the two, the two, you know, roads that we, we you could we could go down. Um, According to you, then, and according to what you know, what are the antidotes to either one? Like how how do they how do they allow how are they allowed to manifest, and what pushes them to not manifest? So, I might say that you know the the scattered one is a sort of a vision that I would like to happen, uh, and I feel that might happen, but I might provide you some anecdotes to, to the other and so, so to the to the uh, sort of sovereign state uh, state control networks I think first and foremost um, education and knowledge and information sharing what um, what actually happened in the last 20 years is that we ne- we never had access to that much of that, uh, information in terms of being able to access information and being able to understand the information 
Because, you know, theoretically, you could go to the library back in the 80s and you could access any sort of information you wanted. But, but practically, reading through the physics 101 uh, back in the 80s bring you as much knowledge as, you know, reading through... Um, you know, the, one podcast possibly. Even. Pretty much right now, it's one <laughs> podcast, one YouTube, one YouTuber. Yeah. You know, doing like thirty minutes of video that explains all the basics of the physics, and you understand more. Yeah. Going forward, and uh, you know, like applying that uh, knowledge sharing ideas, and uh, um, also giving an audience or giving a space for the information to be uh, distributed to to the society will change a lot. So even in 2000s, when we discussed something like, uh, you know, the the control over the website, the content online, people were like, why, why would they do that? You know, it's like, okay, we don't like Pirate Bay, so let's ban these, but the rest, like, keep it as it is, you know. 2010s, people were like, uh, no, let's ban all the streams, uh, all the porn, all the, uh, you know, bookies, everything that, you know, doesn't appeal to the mass public. We're in 2020s and we are at the level of like banning the platforms from uh, having, you know, like they right to operate in a, in, a, in a market. And that changed. I mean, that changed because the, per the, the, the social or the public perception was driven by mainstream media. So they were saying, for instance... We need to ban, uh, ban bookies because they are generating this much of you know negative outcome in 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 uh, societies all over the world. Just to clarify, bookies are bookmakers. Yeah, betting on things. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of we've got a lot of international listeners. Oh, I'm pleased to hear you say the word bookies as a Polish person because <laughs> that's a colloquial term from the UK. But anyway, sorry. Uh, so um, so if you're if you were thinking of the of the way that the mainstream media has been pushing that, uh, I don't want to say agenda, but more narrative towards accepting that view uh, as you know the dominating sort of good uh, outcome, so that we will um, bring some peace or some stability to the virtual space by banning, say, Facebook or Google from you know becoming or like being a monopolies. What we can do and what we should do and what will probably happen is that we should provide information that are actually against that vision. So actually showing that, you know, we had already a few countries in the world that have been pursuing this sort of vision for Internet and it ended with them being unable to gain their passports to get out of this country because of the social score or, uh, you know, being uh, allocated in a worse position in, uh, on, a, on a job market because uh, they, they did something that wasn't as good as, you know, as intended by the public administration. We can end up with, like, the world that uh, we can't access Sci-Hub or Library Genesis at all, meaning that we have to pay uh, several thousand pounds for accessing a single article uh, that is behind that, you know, paywall because... There are so many regulations that are, you know, securing the spot of that, uh, you know, uh, article or that um, publisher to publish it only be behind paywall. Have one viewer of a ten years period, and nobody can access that knowledge. So, meaning that, you know, we can't actually pursue the the progress in general. We can't access a certain information on science, so we are unable to pursue certain, um, you know, outcomes or certain uh, research. So, I mean, you know, if, if we are looking for anecdotes, I'll start looking by, I mean, look at that, the ways to um, uh, help the narrative spread. And by narrative, I mean, think of, you know, the, the consequences. That's pretty much it. <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're, what you're alluding to as, as well, which arguably is more probable, it's just a two-tier society. I mean... Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, restricting the internet is pretty easy to circumnavigate, as you, mm -hmm. you and I both know. If I go mm -hmm. to China, I can go on any website I want. And it doesn't take a lot of knowledge. Um, I think most people don't get there. It's probably about, I don't know, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to guess, 10% of people know how to circumnavigate mm -hmm. 
or not even a VPN, something else. Yeah, mm-hmm. but that, but it's pretty easy to do. That doesn't mean that you can interact with society necessarily if the societal framework is that is that bad. But also that might be banned. Remember that you know that operates because we are interconnected at this point. Which sorry, which the, we can go around the the what is known as internet and access certain information, say in a, a dark internet uh, areas. But that's just because it is still interconnected networks. But if that's banned, if that's cut off, if we cannot, if we don't have that connection, you cannot access it from the from the level of China, for instance. And that's the reality I'm talking about as the as the sort of the, the negative uh, one to zero of the scattered network. Yeah. Oh, okay, but but according to your binary outcome decentralized networks which already exist Mm -hmm. i'm thinking about even bitcoin or nostra you know that that, these are networks where nodes run you run a node in your house they're Mm -hmm. not they're not the you know they're then they're not going away in fact they're only just starting you know what nostra is right Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah nostra is literally just started and you can see already how excited everyone is about the the potential so it's not going to go away and it's going to be very difficult, as you know, to stop. Because if there are 100,000 nodes scattered around the world or relaying messages mm-hmm. to each other, what are you going to do about that? Well, go and knock on everyone's door. Of course you, you're not. You know. So there's always going to be an alternative. And arguably, these alternatives spring up as purely as a, a consequence of the opposing thing, yeah. which is the, the, the fact, I think. I think Bitcoin's a great example because it's a decentralized network. That's basically what it is. And it exists specifically because the centralized network is ruining your life. Mm-hmm. So you, so somebody started working on that many years ago thinking, this is, a, this is terrible. I need a solution. And lo and behold, 2009, boom, there it is. Nostra the same. Social media is becoming terrible. Every, you know, we're getting censored. We're getting this. We get. I know. Here's a direct peer-to-peer social network. You know, and it. You know, so I, 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 I agree that living. Have you ever seen that film Gattaca? Have of you, course. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. It just sprung to mind there because Gattaca is um, a good example of the physical infrastructure of that mm-hmm. authoritarian digital digital authoritarianism yeah. and it, it is rather scary and i think possibly at that point i don't know what your opinion on this is but at that point you need a parallel society because you cannot live in the society when there's a a barrier a physical barrier in front of you that'll only open if you click yeah. your id card on it for example yeah it's 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 fascinating because uh, i had this conversation a few times last uh, in the last year uh i I really like Samuel Edward Konkin. I don't know if you are following the Agro's vision of uh, Samuel Edward Konkin. So no. he was, a, he was a, a sort of a student or associate of Murray Rothbard, and he created this uh, sort of strand of libertarianism that was called, uh, it's called Agorism. Uh, and that yeah. was 70s, 80s. And he was, you know, like one of these guys who was like fantasy and science fiction sort of uh, reader, vivid reader. And uh, he was attending these conferences where he was chatting with people who were writing about the future and so on. And in the 80s, he was predicting uh, that, oh, well, assuming that, you know, <clears throat> society will follow a certain path. And in such a path, you will have three types of market. You will have what is legal what is completely illegal and what is in between. And, uh, you know, people back then were like, oh, no, it won't happen. You know, it's just, it's it's almost impossible that, you know, on, 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 it w- that it will be gaining attraction or it will be having some sort of a, like a volume users. That was uh, 80s. Now we come into 2010s. Uh, you probably are familiar with the Silk Road platform. Mm-hmm. Silk Road, uh, Road platform was basically based on the ideas of algorithm, and you know Silk, Silk Road pr- platform was, I think, a few years uh, before its time. Uh, I mean, its time. So if it was created nowadays, I think it would be completely different type of a platform. It would be much more secured for the owner, for the um, you know, for the people behind it to not be well traced as they are right now, and. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and assume that it does or it does exist right now. Of course, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to pretend that it isn't. But uh, if you actually think of a darknet, darknet is that dark area of the market that Konkin was writing about. The gray area is like when you're trying to omit paying taxes or you're paying less than you should. You know, all these like sort of like gray area things that. Uh, you're not doing have uh, something that is illegal or not fully, but uh, you know it's still sort of like on the edge, you know. And um, it's funny how forty years of you know of uh, of a distance from you know where when he was still uh, still writing and when he was still you know publishing that makes a massive difference because you know back in the eighties, internet was he was a massive fan of internet, but internet was still a tool for kids, you know, for maybe not kids' kids, but like programmer kids uh, in Kali or like in, uh, mostly in Kali. <laughs> and um, and here we are in 2020 and, you know, all these visions are actually coming, coming true. If you're thinking about what you can do in your life, you can follow the logic of the, of the three markets. You know, you can do something in, on the white market, on the legal market, you can do something in a gray area whenever it's possible. And if you really need to, you can cross, you know, the line to to the dark, uh, dark net and uh, and do something there. What well, do you think that's a model going forward for free-minded, open-minded people? Let's say. And I wouldn't say only for free market people. There is going. I mean, and I think that don't don't take my words for granted. But I believe that is already happening even in non-free market uh, societies. If you think what's going on in Hong Kong, for instance, that's what's happening. Uh, that that is what is happening in there. And you know, like you have certain areas where the grey market is larger than the white and the dark. So you are having well societies, not even communities, but societies that operate only in the grey area because uh, the regulations are stupid or like they, they are impossible to follow. Give me an example of that. In uh, Somalia, they are paying with Bitcoin for goats. Right. So, you know, that's uh, well, theoretically... Would, would an example of that be um, in Kenya when people started using mobile phone minutes to pay for things? Exactly. Right. The, the currency so, is so shot to pieces. Exactly. They're actually sending mobile phone minutes to each other for payment. Yeah. Which is uh, the very idea of what, you know, Konkin was saying. So he was saying that, you know, at some certain certain point, if you follow the logic of a grey and a dark market, the white market will disappear or will basically break to, be, uh, to pieces, shut to pieces. So I would say that is, a, well, a strategy of sort. And I, I presume that is going to be a reality for many societies in the next, well, 20, 25 years. I, I usually don't do predictions that are longer because humanity is changing so quickly. So, so under the weight of rules and regulations, mm -hmm. the, I mean, the grey market. I know that the 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 black market should be the free market, but in your example there, the grey market sounds a little bit like the free market. Well, the grey market is uh, the ways of. Uh, well, balancing to a free market, I would say. So something, imagine that, you know, for instance, you are a, a digital nomad. You're trying to find the best jurisdiction for you to allocate your budget or your, you know, your personal income, which is normal for most of the digital nomad or most, most of the people who are not willing to spend too much on their origin market. So they are, for instance, registering themselves in Paraguay, or registering themselves in Bulgaria, in Poland, as a uh, you know single entity sort of uh, entrepreneurs, um, and they're, they're paying taxes in this market, and uh, it's normal because you're you know you find you're trying to find the best way not to spend too much on on you know on taxes on uh, on additional uh, payments towards the government. You find a way to balance yourself, and that's basically the grey market. So it's it's not that it's illegal; it's legal to change your well, uh, not belonging, but sort of like a, a administrative uh, signatures. So mm. instead of you know signing up that uh, yes, I'm living in Manchester, you sign it out from Cyprus. Or so it's not it's not dodging tax. No. It's um, 
it's um, tax avoiding tax or whatever they say. You know? uh, yeah, it's I, those kind of things. Like, yeah, yeah. I would say you know it's just um, probably the best way to put it is that uh, you're trying to. Um, there's a word I forgot that uh, balance sort of like find the best uh, spot like a sweet spot in between what you're seeking and what you can do so you know for instance for the, the billionaires it's usually you know having a very complica complicated scheme to make sure that they're actually optimizing their way towards having the the, the, the highest income the lowest uh, taxation and it exactly, it's exactly the same with individuals, but most of them don't have that such, you know, such uh, resources to, do, to follow the same logic. So they need to do something on a, a smaller scheme. And that optimization of their budgets starts with finding the place where they're going to have, you know, the, the, that sweet spot. And that might be power guide, that might be Okay, um, so prospera. as yourself as a digital nomad then, do you see that p section of digital nomadism as growing it's like and and what i'm I, i'm going to juxtapose digital nomadism here against um you know like instagram influencer travelers because mm -hmm. there's there are this there are you know i've i've been i've seen with my own eyes there's a lot of people that travel and just plaster it all over all over instagram yeah. and there's a lot of people that travel and do what you say, you know, become a legal entity yeah. in Lithuania or somewhere, I don't know, and and use that as a way to run an online business and blah, blah, blah you know. Mm -hmm. There are actually, um, I follow a logic of, uh, of some people that I've read uh, some time ago. There are actually three types of uh, digital nomads. One would be someone who is hired uh, full time by a company but works remotely and can work from anywhere in the world. Uh, the second is the person that is you now running his own or her own um, uh, business as a freelancer, providing services to entities all around the world. And the third one is someone who's actually an entrepreneur and who's running that from anywhere in the world. So, of course, the freelancer and the entrepreneur are not the same because the freelancer are still providing services like a teacher or something like a teacher yeah. like a consultant i'm i'm in this category basically so, so you can only go where someone's going to pay you to be no right? i can go anywhere in the world uh, but i still need to seek for a client and it's not that different from an entrepreneur who's running the business but you know uh, when you're an entrepreneur um, it's better i mean i I would say I'm in between the the two, so I, I, I'm still choosing whom I'm working with, how I'm working with these people, but uh, entities. But uh, but there are people who are completely free of everything. They are running their own business, such as, for instance, uh, the you know blockchain companies that they they, they can live in uh, in Malta, be registered in Paraguay, and everything is is you know fitting together. The freelancers can live, you know, anywhere they want, but they still need to think how they're going to manage clients and how they're going to manage hours so that, you know, if they are working with clients from the US, it's probably best to have the same window. And if you're hired by someone and you're working, uh, uh, you know, remotely, then you can basically, you're working in the office that is just closer to the beach or to the to the nice mountains. That's, that's the only difference. You're still not a full, uh, fully digital nomad. And that's a uh, that's a uh, that's probably coming back to the very original question that uh, you asked. So, what the digital nomadism is, and um, you know how I perceive that, and I think that that's the common misconception of what digital nomadism, nomadism is. And for these two groups, the freelancer and entrepreneurs, there are ways to optimize their well administrative and financial uh, 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 operandus operations so, yeah. so so they need to think of the ways in which they are able to do that in certain markets so it's not as easy as one think um that you know you are having a freelance uh, uh business and you can just register yourself in estonia or in poland for some of them or bulgaria or, or in malta and you're paying the lowest taxes possible and it's you're super you know, fine with everything. You need to have certain, you, you need to pass a certain threshold. You need to have a legal income. So for instance, if you're earning in in Bitcoins, you, in plenty of markets, you can't really, either you're paying taxes on that 
and then you know you have to actually claim how much you have in order to pay taxes and uh, and be legal in a certain system or you're not passing that threshold so you're unable to run the company in such a such a market then you have markets that are allowing that like paraguay or some uh, some or some other areas where you can where you still need to have certain income and you just don't have to say that you know it's for instance for uh, from from bitcoin or something, something like that but um and that's a, that's a very important thing because some people believe that they start they will start doing the digital nomadism and they will be you know like paying taxes on cyprus for instance and it will be great because they won't be you know like uh, restricted by the the taxation system in slovakia poland or, or croatia but it's a misconception because they need to well get to the point and usually it's a uh, it's not a, a few thousand pounds a month it's uh, it's loads of money monthly that you need to have in order to be able to register there so coming back to your question from 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 a second ago um once the free cities or cer- certain spaces are allowing these sort of people to pay taxes in there and register in there and operate legally from there there's going to be massive crowd of people coming there well, that already exists in Prospera. Prospera, you know, that is one of... I mean, obviously, the ways that free city projects have to attract you yeah. at the moment are legislative, yeah. you know. Um, and and obviously, the primary one is low tax, which is because mm-hmm. it's... I mean, it's also one of the most thought about things. I mean, that's mm-hmm. why you live in Monte Carlo or Dubai or anything like that. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I was in El Salvador recently and I met some digital nomads who were of one of your categories. It was the first time I'd actually met anyone like that. They were working for a software project. Mm -hmm. They'd rented a house in San Salvador, a load of them, and they were just all living there. Yeah. And my experience of digital nomads prior to that was not tech people. Mm-hmm. But it appears now that that is why I asked you, is, is this a mo- growing movement? Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like it. It seems to me like the idea that as soon as you've got a job which is online, you'd be crazy not to move jurisdiction in order to maximize at least your income, you know, which is the, mm-hmm. the main one. It seems crazy. And that's hap- as far as my anecdotal evidence is showing me people are doing that more and more. So yeah. arguably you would also then conclude from that that you know free cities are going to arise more and attract people that way. I mean is it true though also currently states do that as well. Like yeah. there are incentive packages for digital nomads to come and um to come and live in this country or come mm-hmm. and study in this. Have you ever a come across those or have you ever done one of those? I haven't done it because uh, my um, my situation is that I still enjoy the good level of um, uh, of lack of administrative power from the British system. So I'm still happy with the British system at this point. But uh, coming forward, I'll be I'll be looking for something else because I'll be once again passing the threshold. So it will be more logical to follow, you know, the available paths. But uh, I've heard of loads of these projects. So Estonia is one of them, one of the most known. What I mentioned in Poland, because Poland is also apparently a good market for some of the freelance, uh, some of the uh, digital nomads. There is uh, Romania uh, that is running something similar. Spain recently started uh, advertising these sort of um, incentives for for digital nomads. What are they though? Like, what are the incentives? Like, so, for instance, you and how pay... do you class yourself as a digital nomad? Like, how do you get so, accepted or whatever? So, you know, you would have to have a, a, a business or a sort of a freelance uh, agency or, or something like that, or like basically a legal entity that is registered somewhere else. But you're coming to a certain country. Uh, at a certain state, and you're becoming a resident in there. I assume in some cases you just have to register your your business and pay taxes in there. In most situations, you would have to be a resident, tax resident in that uh, country. By tax resident, means that you have to be six months plus one day uh, in that particular area, and you're going to be paying taxes in there. You don't have to be there, but you're sort of assuming that you're going to be 
spending that much time in in so is that a gray area or is that a black and white area like uh, because i mean i'm just thinking about spain for example if you registered your company in spain and they gave and they gave you a preferable tax um, rate how would they know whether you were in spain because you can walk to portugal if you want or yeah. and the whole of i mean there's no border <laughs> i mean if you <laughs> but you know still the they are on the assumption that you're going to work in that if you're already registering your uh, your business in that. So if for instance if you're American they're going to control you more than uh, um than uh, Europeans because if you're an American passport you would have to go through you know registering uh, in the local autor- authorities as European you also have to do it but it's not that well, also, America Gosh. will tax you oh, yes, regardless exactly. if you're you an American to, citizen. So exactly. I don't see the point of Americans actually doing it. Uh, no, but there is plenty of them. See Barcelona, for instance, where, where I'm heading to in, uh, in the next few weeks. Um, Barcelona is a market that is flowed by, by, by people who, who came from, from the US in the last three, four years. It's easier and cheaper. Maybe not cheaper per renting but cheaper in general to live in uh, in Barcelona for plenty of people from the US especially from places like New York but they're paying tax in the often, US which is are they paying again, tax in yeah they have, in, to, they have in, to yeah but are they paying tax in in, um, in Spain Spain as well no I assume that they have to I'm, I'm not entirely um, sure but I assume they have to pay some level of taxes in Spain on top of the of the Spanish one. But I mean, there are markets, like for instance, if you're from the UK and you work in Spain, you have a certain um, uh, acts in play that, uh, that say you don't have a double taxation on, on your income. But then again, if you're earning more than, uh, you know, what is a threshold, you would have to pay taxes in the UK, for instance, and then whatever is you know, on top of that threshold, you would have to pay the rest in the Spanish uh, taxation uh, bureau, which is, so that's the problem. At this point, most of the people are aware that there are legal ways, and these are legal ways, even though they are sort of like a grayish, because you're still omitting paying ta- higher taxes in, in some areas. But it's it's more like a wide grayish area. People are unaware of other opportunities. What I told you about the Estonia, Romania, and so on was after weeks of digging through the internet. You have to go through and you have to read. There is this uh, brilliant German uh, lad who's, uh, guy who is uh, traveling all across the world. He's uh, registered somewhere, I think, in Paraguay and uh, uh, somewhere in the US uh, with some companies. And he is writing about, uh, constantly writing about the ways of like, um, Optimizing the tax. Uh, the Do taxes. you know who that is? Staten Laws. Staten Laws. Uh, yeah, I'll send you a link later. I'll on. put it in the show notes. That yeah. sounds interesting. He's uh, he is the guy to talk about the 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 taxes. I mean, you know, of course, I'm not extremely. Fam- I would say I'm one of these amateurs who who read through the content, understand beats, applied what is most most applicable for me understand paths to sort of look for additional info and that's pretty much it so over time i'll be learning more of like my ways but i won't understand everything in the market and this guy is like he's understanding everything in the market but uh, just to finish i feel there is a massive space for ideas like free cities to adv- maybe not advertise but to build an informational wallet of sort in uh, in uh, on internet for people who are looking for such a such a ways of you know like optimizing their personal um, income and taxation uh, in the next years to come. So, for instance, you know some sort of a tool that give you understanding of what you can do and how you can do that uh, in order to 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 be basically more happy if uh, you mean uh, you, you just you type in your details you give them your standard of living your income so, or whatever so, and it says right it your, doesn't have to be app you know it might be app you know it's a, it's interactive people are shorting in the, the 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 time they are spending on things but it might be something like that it might be a video it might be a site i mean we have a we have a a directory of free city projects currently yeah. and it's 
I mean, it, it's as extensive as we can be. It's not, yeah. the map isn't full of them, obviously. But, of course. Yeah. And we, we cover a spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually personally see the Free Cities Foundation as, as, as being at the heart of this. Mm-hmm. And I do think it's a growing movement. And I do think it's the right time for this kind of movement to grow, Absolutely, specifically yeah. for all the things you've mentioned so mm-hmm. far. Um, so it's good to hear someone who's actually living the nomadic life point that out but how would it how would you relate it though to your average sedentary person um are they i mean i i I mean i'm particularly thinking about people with families it's not as easy to just up sticks and move jurisdiction when you've got family around you um that's one of the big problems i see the the cultural and societal network that you're part of um you know it's all very well meeting your online friends in real life but you don't just sever ties with your family at the same time i think well a lot of young men do <laughs> a lot, but um in my experience a younger women mm-hmm. or certainly old married women and women with children like to be around their their families um so you know how does this all right here's my question right um what is your strategy going forward um and what is your how are you preparing for an outcome that you don't like the look of let's say the 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 centralized authoritarian mm-hmm. outlook where you have a digital id for movement you have a digital id for access in the internet you're gate kept at every stage of your life mm-hmm. what's your preparation for that if anything (laughs) you may not even have preparation i don't know so the first question first so the first one was how i do perceive the mm, uh, the solution for you know families and so on i don't think there is going to be solution for this generation that will be appealing to everyone there is solution that will appeal to extremes in that group and i feel that is a target at this point but Referring back to what I was saying earlier on, over the 10 years, 10, 15 years period, there's going to be a massive change in how we perceive reality, uh, how we perceive uh, relations with people, how we perceive homeland and so on and so on. And that's how, you know, that, that window uh, for people who are interested in moving not only jurisdictions, but also, you know, pushing towards uh, achieving this goal of dream will be, you know, widening. So that's that's the first question. The second, I assume, and um, that's based on well observation of the of the virtual worlds in the in the last well twenty five years. I assume it will be on. I will be, and people will follow. Maybe not me, but we'll follow the same process. It will be even more angry center. So it w- it would be even more of. Um, pushing towards um, grey and dark net sort of opportunities. As you said, even though there is infrastructural block on something, it doesn't mean that it will be fully, fully blocked given the advancement of technology. So... But, all right, talk, like what about a, the physical block of you not being able to get on an aeroplane? Are you saying, right, we'll just rent a private aeroplane or something? Is it... So that's that's the assumption. If we are going as far as being unable to 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 board a plane, I assume there is going to be plenty of people with boats. Well, look, I, I interviewed someone in El Salvador, um, some uh, some Canadians, yeah. who said that during the pandemic, people were chartering planes to get out of uh, get out of Canada who didn't want to take uh, the vaccination, for example. Yeah. So it does happen. Of course, but, but I'm 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 like that's very much at the extremes. I'm, so I would I'm, say that that extremes will be also widening. So my, my understanding of the process is that. Even though there is going to be an X, so for instance, the authoritarian growth, there is going to be also a Y that will be growing uh, um, in the same on the same level of growth of people who are unwilling to agree with uh, the authoritarian changes. And this will go in line. That would be parallel. 
Okay, so back to my question then. How are you preparing mm -hmm. to be on? I, I Obviously, I'm assuming you're going to be on the decentralized arm of the... Yeah, yeah. I would say, uh, again, and I'm coming back to what I already said, uh, learning, reading through, understanding uh, of the ways to get out of the uh, loophole. So if you... If we are talking about, for instance, the very idea of uh, digital IDs, digital currency, everything, you know, controlled by the authorities, the China level of control, the uh, social engineering and so on, that won't happen in the next five years, of course. That won't probably happen in the next 20 years, even though there might be a level of that in the, in the society, so all over the world. But in that span, you can provide so much information and so much knowledge to the society that they will find counterparts, sort of uh, counter uh, strategies. Uh, counter for that, measures, yeah. 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 So imagine, for instance, um, uh, I know that plenty of people are against uh, Elon Musk right now and uh, his ideas of, uh, of, of any sorts, but he's pushing that Starlink idea. Starlink. Which, which I'm a user for, for the last year or so. Brilliant, brilliant service. Works everywhere. We've been like in the middle of a uh, black forest in Germany, with our camper van and uh, and I was working with my clients downloading you know gigabytes of uh, data, data like out of you know pure clear sky nothing around me sort of space but Starlink isn't the only solution like that that exists in the world it's the most efficient some companies are pushing the the very same idea of like having a, either a satellite internet or some some other form of providing an internet to to people around without the need of the ground infrastructure. So I'm assuming that, you know, once we're going to have more, uh, as I said, with the authoritarian growth and the and the counterpart sort of uh, uh, growth uh, in the, uh, at the same level, there is going to be a massive level of solutions created online uh, or, you know, well, at least spread online that will be providing not only knowledge but sort of like to-do lists of what to do in, in in order to get out of that loophole and i would say something like uh, 101 on darknet on pirate app sort of uh, uh that will be that and it's not that we don't have um a case in the history that uh, that would be you know like that uh, i assume you remember 2005s 2000 2000s like mid 2000s there was this site on uh, Spanish uh, Spanish site. It was called Roja Directa. Don't know that. There was an entire law that was created out of it. Roja Directa was the biggest streaming uh, site online. It was streaming football, basketball, tennis. Like illegally. Illegally. But yeah. it was, you know, like Bangladeshi uh, league in Europe. So, of course, you know... Hold like on a it was Spanish site hosted in Spain. Hosted in Spain, and then they were moving servers, but they became an object of a uh, well a campaign of the American state because of the streaming of NBA and NFL and so on. So it was a copyright, and, and of course, and uh, they were uh, well, they were they were banned. Of course, they operate in under dif different names, but and there is plenty of sites. It's like cutting one leg and, you know, two legs are, are grown. So it's basically the same. So there's millions of uh, sites that, that are, I mean, at streaming right now. Back then, it was one of the few sites and the, the, the biggest. But the funny thing that happened after banning Raha Directa is that plenty of communities online, and that was not only forums, but already, you know, uh, creating social media and so on. Uh, but basically forums, chat rooms, uh, and uh, social media were providing information on how to access that very area of the streaming area to the extent that that blew to millions of different sources. Nowadays, you can't ban streaming. No. It's impossible. Oh. It's like Hydra, you know, uh, mm. uh, like it's, it's quite literally you're typing in a platform that is known to everyone like Reddit or anything like ERC uh, channels or like Discord and you're going to find something. As, as well, I mean, Pirate Bay is the best example of that. Of isn't course, it? yeah, but Pirate Bay is not that public. As in, it requires certain knowledge of how to access Pirate Bay. I don't know. There, there, there are pirate. You can just type it into Google. I think I don't know a lot. No, you have you have to follow certain uh, logic of Pirate Bay. But it's hosted in 
There's so many different places. Oh, yeah. And it's the same. It's Pirate Bay. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the idea is that you're providing tools. Pirate Bay is one of the tools, but, uh, and of course, the original tool. Uh, but, you know, but it means that in our reality that we are existing in, you cannot push the certain sort of uh, umbrella overlook over everything because there is always going to be someone who will be outside of that. And these people will create, you know, additional spaces for people who are unwilling to follow. Okay, then well, my next question then is um, how many of those people are there? Because it appears to me that they're at the fringe are those people that are looking for an alternative. Um, I'm not so sure it will ever be even the majority, let alone a large number of people. I'm not sure that most people care enough. So, I mean, I, I see probably one of the most likely futures is... 85, 90% of people living in a very restricted environment and 15 or 10% of people living parallel lives outside of it, which is kind of what's happening at the moment, isn't it? I mean, when I look mm -hmm. at my, I look at the world, you know, what I walked through Warsaw yesterday to go and buy something and, you know, it's like you look at everyone and you think, I wonder what everyone's thinking here. Yeah. Um, most people aren't thinking what I'm thinking, almost well, certainly. Most people have never had this conversation. Most yeah. people are not wondering about different jurisdictions. and um, So is this movement, let's call it, ever going to be, you know, large? Or is it, is it just going to suit the people that want it? And, and it's, you know, a, a small section of society. So let me let me ask you something. How many people back in 2000 were aware of uh, uh, the volume of conspiracy theories that you can see right now? Um, I don't know. I think I think a lot of people didn't read them. <laughs> I mean, and you're right. There were there were a number of famous conspiracy theories, um, but they weren't followed by many. My yeah, point is that internet is a very weird tool. It provides you with everything that we know as human beings. And every single day we're doubling or tripling that knowledge. Yet there are um, there is a massive number, a massive volume of people who are reading through that and choosing to believe in plenty of theories that I don't want to name. Flat Earth, just name it. For instance, or <laughs> that you know Elvis is still alive. I mean, even at oh, I don't know about that. He might is. be. I tell you, I saw a really good one last night because me and Peter were talking about the pyramids. Oh yeah, right. And someone posted a picture of the pyramids as the tips of mega of huge oh, yeah. <laughs> like um, needles. Yeah, you know, going going hun you know, hundreds of meters down into the ground. That was a new one for me. But so so that's my point. And uh, back in the late nineties, if you would have one uh, every thousand people believe, maybe not thousand, but I don't know numbers. I don't want to you know think about them. But if you th if you think of a society back then, there were people who were believing be believing in in complete random things. They were believing in uh, well. Uh, the country being controlled by lizards was probably one of the most famous ones. Moon landing, so, moon lighting well. is fake, yeah. and all these, all these. But uh, it wasn't that every X person in ten. I would assume it's probably every fifth or sixth person in the. Sorry, every every five of ten people in the society, or every six people in the society out of ten, believes in some sort of a conspiracy theory. Again, I'm not saying that is a real number. I assume it will be around that. And uh, by conspiracy theory, it's something that goes against mainstream and that isn't based on the logical grounds or on the on the on the, on the science facts. Science fact is a different. Well, yeah. Concept, but, uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say. I mean, it's depending who who classes what as a conspiracy, isn't it? I mean, true. Sure. I think um, the. The good, the best example of this is the alternative media, which used to be the alternative media. Um, you know, is now for most people the media, yeah, the, their version of the media. Um, and on alt media, you get to hear longer form discussions from absolute experts in their field, yeah. which you don't tend to see on the whole 
yeah. on what we what some people call the mainstream media. Well, absolutely agree with, with that. But uh, it's just because, you know, the conspiracy theories are always having, you know... But the, the, what I mean is the word conspiracy theory in a lot of a case, a lot of situations is just a different theory to the mainstream theory exactly it's you know it doesn't have to be classed as conspiracy obviously a, a way of disregarding it is to call it a conspiracy theory but it's just a theory and i think people who whose focus is on new media i, I don't know what to call it it's not alt media because it's not it's the it's it's almost mainstream for a lot of people i call it they, media alt or old media pre-social media so like forum sites and everything and social media i think is the best what term. would you call something like the joe rogan podcast for example because that is a very very that, that's a social media social media oh okay as okay. in but i mean it's it's um is it I've got a feeling it's the biggest show on earth. It is. Uh, right, okay. Definitely. So, so by nature, it's the mainstream, right? Uh, yeah. So, yes. <laughs> because it's the biggest show on earth. But, and this is the strange thing about people who, I, who complain um, about, uh, you know, if it, something's happening in the world and people complain, well, why aren't the BBC reporting on this? Why aren't CNN reporting mm. on this? And my first thought is, yeah, but who cares? Like, more people watch joe rogan than watch those organizations probably combined i'm just pure Most conjecture that, yeah. yeah right so so the question is why isn't i don't know joe rogan talking about this and evidently he normally is that's the yeah. thing you know and my point wasn't that uh, you know the conspiracy theories are fake or wrong i'm just talking about people who are believing in them who are believing in something that is out of the mainstream uh just because you know something is of the mainstream and it's called uh, conspiracy theory doesn't mean that doesn't it, it isn't real or at least at some level real. My point is that it changed with the internet. Once the internet became the dominant aspect of reality, and that's how I actually explain the internet to people. It's a dominant aspect of reality that overtook every other aspect uh, apart from living the physical living. Um, as in, you know, being a biological body and actually functioning. Um, from that very point, the amount, the sheer amount of, uh, of, of, of conspiracy theories that are believed in has grown, like, it's a massive number. But what is that signal? That means that people are going outside of what is told in mainstream media and started to dig by themselves to look for some information somewhere. Okay. And so that it's a also symptom means, of that. It's not a symptom of anything else. No, it's no. It's a symptom of people not following the same sort of sort of like a rat hole of some sort. So they are willing, at least portion of that society is willing to dig for some information outside of what is told, and that's probably the biggest change in what the internet brought. Right. So this begs the question then. Um, because this already happens is um, information fatigue um, and conspiracy theories is a good example because you might there are so many things to discover outside of the mainstream narrative let's call it um, that already you know, you you it's it's a quagmire, it's a complete quagmire of information. Mm -hmm. So, as a tech person yourself, um, what how, where does that go? Like, what's the what's the what's the culmination of that? And I'm going to add into that deep fakes um, of voice, visual. I mean, like we're entering a horrendously um, terrible time to research things when you can already create uh, you know a very realistic picture of you saying what well, i can make you say whatever i want you to say mm -hmm. very easily now even even with free ai tools out there mm -hmm. you can make a relatively good one so so you know what are the systems that are going to evolve to to give you the average human being the ability to to notice truth and etc so one thing is that uh, the fake uh, in the history of human civilization was always there. 
If you think of the biggest example, the, the most known example of the fake in the society is like a echo chamber, I mean, not the echo chamber, the echo uh, phone, sort of like uh, you're echoing what last person said and you're... Chinese you know, that, whispers, we call Chinese it. whispers, there we go. Yeah, I forgot the name. So you were having that throughout the history and that was, you know, repeating certain stories in a way that, you know, original story was long lost. But... Um, the fake is the, the idea that always existed in human civilization because humans like to fake things to achieve certain goals. Uh, I believe that together with the AI that is uh, developing and the, 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 the ways it is um, accessing and providing information, we will have tools that will be able to actually find the difference in between what is real, what is, uh, what is um, um, not, made by, uh, not man-made. Uh, and that also refers to the next step of humans. And here we come to my futurologist sort of uh, uh, inclinations. Uh, in the next, I would assume, 20 years, we'll start entering the age of uh, enhanced humans. And that's, that's not under any sort of uh, uh, discussion. This is going to happen. That's for sure. We're already at this point, to be frank, with most of the things that we are doing as humans, I work with people who are able to uh, build, you know, the uh, sort of connection in between brain and a uh, 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 lack of hand. So the the person was born without hand, they still have impulses from the brain. So they build, you know, the connection in between t- in between two to the level that they are able to, you know, move an egg. I think egg is the is the current level of the of the progress. So. We're talking about the biological en- enhancement of, uh, say, for instance, lack of uh, uh, lack of hand or, or any other part of the body. I mean, I mean not, not any other, but most of the part of the body is. But coming f- further, we'll start implementing things like Neuralink. And of course, Neuralink is the most sexy, the most known one. But I mean, we're already enhanced human beings, aren't we? If you're and holding a phone in your hand, you're an enhanced human being. Exactly, but that's still a tool that's outside of human body. In the next 20 years, we will have it inside the human body. Not in a way of like having a Robocop vision, uh, you know, connected to the internet, but we'll have much more power of uh, controlling things with our bodies rather than just devices. And uh, by that, once we are hitting that very level... Also, the devices will be able to uh, divide in between reality and uh, non-reality things. Because that will be, again, if you have a technology A, you will have technology B that will yeah. be you know, developed simultaneously to assess the... Yeah. I mean, that obviously sounds rather harrowing because, okay. well, um, from what I know about the digital realm anyway, at least I get to sort of like put it down and walk away and go and live in the forest or whatever. Yeah. And you could call me old fashioned, I suppose. Um, but I don't like the idea of, is that transhumanism, right? Is in a way, a, yes. Right. A form of whatever trend. Yeah. Incorporating technology directly into the body, which, you know, I already have, I, I've contact lenses. Um, you know, I'm getting my eyesight fixed in, in mm-hmm. a few weeks, you know, yeah. I am enhancing my own body. What bothers me about transhumanism is um, the fact that I already feel vulnerable in the technological realm anyway, let alone Mm -hmm. when it's part of my own body. And if you really think there's a binary future ahead, um, do you really want to be in that binary future with an authoritarian regime having access to your body? (laughs) There are two things to discuss in here. One is that, as always, once you're going to have an enhanced body, sort of human 2.0, sort of vision of having additional uh, components in your body that will be enhancing your, well, physical abilities and intellectual capabilities and so on. That's one thing. If you have a group like that, you have a group that doesn't follow that, that don't like it. And that might be related to the generational issues. Well, that will definitely be me. And I'll be in my garden. <laughs> drinking you know. a, sipping a gin and tonic, I guess. No, I'll be in my garden creating food for myself. I mean, I've thought this one through many times because I, I think, you know, transhumanism and 
general technology will make most of us redundant mm -hmm. in, in many ways. And in particular, and I find that uh, a scary prospect because I think it's completely underestimating the importance of the need for um, a, a meaning to your life. And, and your meaning is often derived from hardships that you go through and, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. And, and what all this stuff does maybe not so much transhumanism, but certainly the technological side, robotics, you know, mm -hmm. is it creates um, a lot of convenience in our lives. And I'll take gardening as an example, mm -hmm. right? So I can say I wanted to be self-sufficient as a, as, a, as a gardener. That would give me huge self-worth. It would actually, mm -hmm. it, would be, it would give my life great meaning. Currently, it's, more ex it's much harder and more expensive than actually just, you know, buying, going to the shop and buying my fruit and veg. Mm -hmm. But I do it because it gives me a sense, a, a sense of achievement, let's say. And that makes me a happy human, makes me a confident human, right? If I was to offset that job to a robot, which you almost certainly already can in a very primitive way, but in another 50 years, the price of personal robots will probably be the same as a mobile phone. I don't know. Probably, you mm -hmm. know, so I can instruct my personal robot to, all right, go and sow my seeds, night tend my garden. So I'm getting my, my fruit and veg, but I'm not getting any of the meaning from it. The robot is. Yeah. And so I see this fork in the road, the fork where, you know, you, you, you just call it generational and it, it could well be. I'm, I'm the generation that would at that point go and garden for myself. Mm -hmm. And my children, I hope not, but uh, they may want to inaugurate, uh, sorry, uh, they may want to um, enhance their bodies mm -hmm. and use the tech to make their life more convenient. Um, I'm, yeah, I don't, it doesn't, I don't think that looks good. I, I think, go on, prove me I, wrong. I actually think that it's normal. It's absolutely normal what you say. And I know for sure, because humans are humans and you have, you know, plenty of data in the history, there's always going to be a group that is against that. Always. Humans are very rare uh, species that always works against uh, what's theoretically best for them. Because theoretically, it's best for you to have, you know, enhanced body, enhanced physicality and so on. But humans prefer, in general, prefer what they believe they're comfortable with e or at. In, in general, that's how cultures were developing. People were feeling comfortable in the middle of the mountains on the way from, from Africa to Europe, so they ended up in Caucasus, which isn't the best way to leave, uh, given you know, the harsh winter and uh, super hot uh, uh, summer. But they ended up in there because that was the comfortable spot for them to you know, sort of start the, 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 the community, society, the civilization of their own. Uh, so there are always going to be people who are going to re sort of refuse uh, the, the, the technology on such a level. Uh, and it's actually happening right now. There's plenty of people who are going offline from their online uh, selves because this is what uh, makes them happy. I refer to my uh, thesis. I've been chatting with these Polish libertarians and plenty of them actually told me about that very um, division. So they know that they are always virtual libertarian. They're always living that. But some, you know, this is like a part of their life. But some of them underline that it doesn't make them virtual libertarians only. One of them specifically said, it's like, I'm, I'm not going through the street in Warsaw, you know, looking at people and thinking... Oh, uh, uh, what would Murray Rothbard say about, you know, them working in a, I don't know, corporation or whatever. That's not how they exist. It's just a layer. And it's exactly the same with technology. It's a layer that might be super thick, but it is still a layer to your humanity. And I assume, given the current trend of going offline and going, you know, away from technology, that it is actually going to grow over time. Okay. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm sure it's going to grow. I'm not convinced 
I that my my legacy my ideas will probably die out with me possibly on this one but like here's an example right um of of this this form of thinking look, look at cars okay mm-hmm. so and i you know i 20 30 years ago when my car went wrong i could open the bonnet and have a bit of a tinker and i kind of i knew my a little bit about a car mm-hmm. i mean i'm not going to say i would always but if you went back to my father's generation he only fixed our car he never took it to a garage okay mm-hmm. i have a car now with sensors all over it. it's completely electronic it's all, mm-hmm. and when anything flashes at me i have to take it to the I have to take it to the garage and the guy plugs a box into it and he tells me, oh, this, that and the other. Half the time it's just the sensor gone wrong, but still, I know, it's not the point. The point is, I find that kind of technology very disempowering as a sovereign individual. As a sovereign individual, I want to be able to tinker with my own technology. I want to be at the level of the technology. You know, I want to be able to understand it. I don't want to... I, I know we're all standing on the shoulders of mm-hmm. our ancestors who created all this stuff, but yeah. with a machine like a car in, as it, in its former incarnation, I can t- I can do it. I don't imagine I'm ever going to be able to tinker with my own Neuralink, for example. Maybe we will. I don't know, but I already know that your average and. I get this from young mechanics and old mechanics when I take my car. I always have a bit of a natter with them. And they all hate it as well. They say, all I'm doing is this now. You know, it's like, it's not necessarily all good, I don't think. Technology isn't all good. And so, I mean, what do you think about that? Absolutely agree with you that technology is not always good. It doesn't mean that it isn't uh, simplifying the entire processes for people. Because, you know, back in the days with uh, gar- garage, you know, you, you get in a car to the garage and you, you, you leave in the car to, to fix a single, single small thing and uh, you end up with, like, uh, um, the mechanics charging you, whatever, £2,000 for something that, you know, they discovered in the car. Because, you know, you don't know nothing about the car. So they said, oh, by the way, it broke in here and the other thing broke in there and so on with the current level of the computer sort of scanning, you know for sure that X is uh, broken. You know, for instance, the gears are broken and that's all. Yeah, but you know I, I mean? mean, I'm looking at it from the sense of how empowered am I of- as a human being? And I that's at the core of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, are we self-sovereign individuals? Are we empowered? This is this is more important to me than being able to surf the internet with my brain, for example. Like, So, see, that... That is going to be a generational, like in in in, in general, generational in the uh, uh, in the most universal sort of term is is a process of change. Imagine that you mentioned your dad or your granddad. Uh, imagine that at the beginning of the century, our granddads uh, were having a certain level of knowledge. A level of knowledge for them was to remember certain skills and uh, remember how to do something in order to achieve something because that was the only way of knowing uh you know if you wanted to bake a bread you had to ask your mom and she had to ask her mom uh, in order to learn how to bake a bread of course you could ask your neighbor as well but usually it's passed in within the family and then outside of the family as well the same with the car you know like uh, of course in the 20s in, in poland you could rarely find a good car and well a car in general outside of towns but like in say in the 50s everyone knew how to you know fix something especially after the war when they needed to do that uh, so they knew how to fix any given vehicle uh, in the 2000s you don't have to have that skill because there are people who are doing that for you and that's a specialization. That's the basic of the of the free market. And you can do other things. You can start learning new language. You can start accessing some information and so on. Going forward, it's going to be exactly the same thing. We'll find pleasure in other things. And I assume that might not only be what we are knowing now, now as uh, you know what brings you pleasure. I think that I'm not an extreme fan of that, and I don't I actually don't like the idea. But I, f- I think plenty of people will find their uh, living in the virtual re- realm, as in meta sort mm. of uh, 
uh, alternative reality. And referring to the movies that we both know, the the movie that you know someone is uh, uh, plugged to the machine and they are living in the in the virtual second life sort of uh, uh, reality, that will happen at some point. That's Ooh. more than certain. We don't know when, but it will happen. Well, it's People, already once again, it's already happening to a certain degree. Yeah, it's a, the, it's through a screen on the whole, but with VR, it's almost not anymore. And yeah. Then there, yeah, but I don't see that as necessarily good. And I and I'm and I'm I'm quite. I'm relatively resolute about the the difference between the digital realm and the phys- and the real realm. Then the only thing that's going to change my mind is that I wake up one morning and realize that reality, the whole thing is a you know, the fake. whole thing is fake. Yeah. You know, which could, yeah, it the, it could be true. It could be true. But mm-hmm. other than that, obviously, I'm embedded in the physical world, mm-hmm. and I see, for example, going back to what you were saying about. Um, you know, finding new ways to feel meaning in your life with all this additional enhanced technology as part of you. Don't you see that as a very disempowering thing? Because, you know, let's say I have Neuralink and yes, I have access to um, the whole of Google in real time as I'm talking to you, right? Would notch me up massively. I would be able to talk about anything at any time. However, once when that switch is off or when something goes wrong, I know, you know, like, where's me? Where's the part of me that's, that's, that's a self-sovereign individual that can survive mm-hmm. for the, I, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of years of that version of us mm-hmm. that, that, so. that lived, that, that in, in junior, ingenious, you know, that, that was, that relied on themselves that was that needed the you know now you're relying on a circuit board that someone else made that you have no idea what's going on i mean the the evolution of that circuit board was a thousand people you've never met before and unless you track unless you go the same route as them you're never going to understand how to fix that or what that is uh, first thing just to clarify Neuralink won't be the access to internet in the you know at, at least not at this level it will be sort of like a uh, scanning the or like enhancing your biological um, capability so you know for instance how much of a blood pressure you will have that would be the first iteration so you'll have like a, a tool that will give you a chance to to better yourself uh, to answer your second question or to answer the question itself i think it's natural so if you think of uh of uh uh, do you know the story of the pencil uh, by Leonard Reed uh, was popularized by Friedman? So there is not a single person in the world that would be able to build a... Um, okay, there's pencil. thousands of people involved in the production exactly. of a pencil. And that happens with anything and everything. So basically, yeah, but I, could, think, I think I could go out and make you a pencil if you really wanted me to. If, you, if I need it, or I would just get a bit of charcoal, mm-hmm. which is really easy. Yes. And, and I, How many people do you think are actually willing to sacrifice so much to for a single pencil that they can buy for a 10 uh, cents? Or not many. That's my point. So I do understand that it's going to be always people like you who are going to, uh, you know, try to, or they will try to live outside of what technology offers. And that, that's going to happen even when the technology will be, you know, like in the sci-fi movies, quite literally taking you over to the virtual real realm, you know, to live your life fully in there, like just just in there. That There, there always will be people who are, you know, doing something else. They, they, they are still, you know, offline. But my point is that, uh, you know, if if throughout history we've been simplifying our ways of achieving things, then it's going to end, we ended up with doing something else that was bringing, you know, the progress, the advancement, the, the happiness to humans. That is going to happen in the future as well. Otherwise, humans will die. But that will happen anyway at some point. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like if in the 18th or, well, 16th century, we started the, uh, the, the process that is known nowadays as the Industrial Revolution, we started simplifying ways of uh, making, you know, like, uh, producing uh, clothing, or, or then started to simplify the mining, 
then started to simplify the, you know, the, we, we started with steel, we started with vehicles, trains, uh, cars, planes, and so on. We are in the 21st century where, you know, most of the things are simplified because of the computers and internets. And we're still finding some pleasure in life. And I actually feel that most of the people who are living in the contemporary times are having much more time for pleasure than in the recent, recent history. That means that in the future, it will happen in exactly the same way. People will find their ways to achieve the, the, the pleasure. And, uh, and you can actually observe that. If you look at people who invested in uh, early, in, uh, say, crypto, in, 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 in bitcoins, they uh, earned loads of money in a very short uh, span of time. And they started to build things that they found, you know, interesting. And uh, that brought peace to themselves, but also to the community around them. And, you know, the, the Prosper is one of the, uh, one of the projects that are also founded by people who, who are investing early. So I assume, you know, that we'll find ways of achieving something as in terms of advancement, but human aspect of living. Uh, like natural aspect of living will also be expanded or extended i yes i i can i can understand what you mean i suppose the only thing that you haven't addressed there is the fact or the thing i can see is that um the current iteration of technological advancement it is the first time in history that technology is inaugural is sorry is becoming part of of us i mean mm -hmm. you know a tool is an extension of you mm -hmm. you know this the invention of the spade uh, or the you know the pickaxe or something is an extension of you you know what we're talking about here is um something quite different and if you you know the span of i think anyway this the span of technical technological advancement happened for hundreds of thousands of years bit by bit and then all of a sudden you've got this oh my God moment where we now appear to be able to outsmart e the evolutionary process. Technology followed a, 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 a sort of followed us, didn't mm. it? You know, it, 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 it followed a, a very simple evolutionary process. Yeah. And that was us evolving at the same time. Now we've got this point where we can go, okay, well, we don't have to wait hundreds of thousands of years for humans to evolve now. We can just do X, Y, Z and and cheat, you know, evolution, which I, I'm not saying is right or wrong or, or good or bad, but it does seem unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And and normally those kind of things don't work, don't work out the way we think they're going to work out. You know? Yeah, but, you know, it's um, probably that the reason why I'm defending that much of, a, you know, of advancement isn't only the free market perspective because, you know, free market perspective itself says that you should see for the outcome and the outcome is uh, good for whoever is on the market and choosing, you know, the whatever they are doing on the market. But uh, I'm also one of the rare optimists in the, in the technological spectrum, in the technological world. Nowadays, in the last, well, 15 years or maybe 10 years, I would say, after the 2008, so 15 years, the dominant narrative in the technological world was everything will be doomed pretty much so social media is uh, manipulative uh, we're living in the age of control authoritarianism and this and that and understand that and I, uh, you've heard me saying things that are very scary and that might end up with us being in a much worse position than we are at this point but at the same time i believe in humans that's probably one of the most important aspects of me as an individual uh, individualist as well. I believe that humans have tendency to find good ways to, well, live. So I assume that over time, what we are having as an extension of our, you know, uh, body, so for instance, you know, the, the, the phones that will be incorporated in our bodies at some point, that will only simplify uh, processes for us, but it won't take away from us the knowledge, the skills of how to achieve things. Have you? Are you a gamer? No. 
There is a very in the very dark history. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to have a computer called a, a ZX81, a ZX oh. Spectrum. I doubt you've ever heard of one of those. No, no, it's one of the original ones, the, right. the, the, the old ones. Well, for anyone listening to this, uh, I used to play Manic Minor and things like that. Anyway, that's very random, but no, I'm not a gamer. It's um, in, a, in a contemporary gaming, you have plenty of phenomenal narratives that are good to follow because they give you a perspective of how certain things can work out. One of these games that I absolutely adore is Horizon. Horizon is this game developed by uh, the Dutch um, Dutch team, I think. Yeah, from Netherlands. Guys from Netherlands. Anyway, they developed the world in the future. Uh, sorry for a spoiler, a spoiler attack. Wait a minute, this is a kind of role-playing, uh, you it's know, like a, first-person game. First-person you... role-playing game, yes. Right, right. So spoiler attack uh, for the next three minutes. Um, you are in this uh, world of ours, but I think thousands of years in the future or something like that. Thousand years in the future. Where most of the people around the world are living in, uh, in these primitive ways, you know, of like uh, very Stone Age sort of maybe Bronze Age sort of uh, setting. They're fighting with each other and there is a dominant amount of weird animals that are not animals because they are made of uh, steel, basically like a robotic an- animals. And of course, you know, you start and you don't know what's going on. You find in some random cave and you ended up with this uh, little device that gives you extension to your knowledge. And the game, of course, you know, is about... The, the, that girl, you know, that you're playing, finding the connection in between these past worlds of uh, of us, you know, and and their contemporary, uh, I mean, contemporary. For so them. just trying to work out where you are and what's going. Exactly, on. Right. but there is a, you know, once you play this game, you find out that the very, you know, the very things that you've been discussing. So they are discussing, for instance, she's listening to someone describing a computer of some sort, or like some sort of a. Um, of an agri- agricultural tools and, you know, stuff like that. And she's listening to that. She doesn't understand the word at, begging, at the beginning, at least. And uh, you, you starting to realize that they lost all that knowledge. Also because there was a, a plot twist in there, but uh, they lost all the human knowledge uh, that was available uh, to them, you know, at, uh, at some point thousand years, be- thousands or thousand years before. And, uh, and yet she's, you know, she's, they are able to develop that, you know, uh, society yet again, following the same, you know, pathway, sort of. And uh, that that game gives you a perspective that, you know, he, humans, if only they exist in the future, if only, you know, there is any clash, any doom that will happen, we'll still follow the same way because humans are basically programmed to advance. Well, I mean... And this is for another conversation because we've been talking for more than two hours and I'm, oh. I know we'll stop soon. Maybe we should have another conversation about this because, um, I've spoken to a number of people about technology, about technology being a thing mm-hmm. that is using us to mm-hmm. produce it. It's a, it's a living thing. Technology. I think there's a, there's a, a book called, uh, what technology wants. Have you read that? talks about the technium mm-hmm. as being a, a realm which is which we're creating but when I look at it um, I just see us recreating reality in now the digital I mean this whole thing has been moving towards creating a, a world which we're and, and which we're in control of almost and it's almost like you could say it's a you know you could sit with a psychiatrist and he would say all you're trying to do is to is to deal with the world Mm -hmm. being out of your control and you've spent hundreds of thousands of years reaching this point where you're creating a world that you feel control over because you're mimicking the world basically everything that we do is has been moving towards this point where we can create this digital realm and as you say a number of people will choose to reside in it and you know what, and it's funny, it's extremely funny, because in the normal world, I would say normal, so in this world, where we sit in this room in Warsaw, most people don't have control over anything but their lives. And a lot of people don't even seem to have control over their exactly. lives. 
But in the technological world, however you perceive it, you have control over everything, or at least most of the things. So that level of control gives you a certain perspective. And I would say that that relates to us being much more um, free market, um, I don't want to say free market, but individualist oriented than most of us, most of us realize. We actually want to live our lives the way that we want, yet because of the several constructs that uh, that are given or that are you know adopted, we are unable to do so. We are unable to change the government towards you know something that is uh, better uh, for us or better suited for us because we don't believe that we can do a change at all. <laughs> but maybe it's I don't know if it's a belief or something else, but I feel that might be. It's just something that's just occurred to me actually. Maybe. Maybe this is the evolutionary process. It's going from world to world. Mm -hmm. You know, like I agree with what you just said. In the digital realm, you could create the the, the a libertarian utopia, for example, and live in it. Yeah, uh, I, I know. Uh, obviously, <laughs> the old man in me is still going. Well, hold on a minute. That doesn't sound right. But I can fully, I could fully believe that that is just the arc of evolution, and then mm -hmm. you enter that realm that's another stage of evolution mm -hmm. and then there's another realm and another realm a bit like a computer game you know it is you know it's it's also fascinating because if you actually look at the um, a whole science concept of science or maybe even more a concept of our current knowledge it appears so that there are different universes there are different civilizations all over the the space there might be a we, separate uh, realities in which, you know, this happens differently. Yes. And if we know that, you know, it means just that we are following a certain path that might have been followed by many, but might not have been followed by no one. And it gives you a perspective that you know nothing. <laughs> well, I'd say that's a great way to end our conversation, <laughs> that we know nothing. But I need to know one more thing from you. Mm -hmm. Um and it's been a great conversation. This is something I ask everyone that comes on this podcast to, um, to, to, to gauge your answer. It's always quite interesting to see how you do. Um, if you were granted a one-year sabbatical in which everything was paid for, you don't have to worry about money, so you could do whatever you wanted, what would you pursue or do in that one year? Probably the very same thing that I'm doing right now, but without the constraints of, uh, you know, of any way, of any financial administrative way. I would just uh, dig through the cultures, talk to people, uh, go from Guatemala to San Salvador, uh, maybe on foot if I have time, uh, then flew to Nepal or somewhere, maybe walk, you know, around Burkina Faso. If only I knew that I have a year that I don't have to care about anything. I would read as much as possible because I love reading. And uh, me and my girlfriend would probably just uh, wonder. And I think the most important in that wonder would be to talk to people rather than, well, with people rather than to people. But not have an agenda, as in not pro produce a book, a podcast, uh, whatever, I don't know. See, just would it be... Don't I, take this the wrong way. Self indulgent. Yeah. See, I see, um, I see that as a process. If you are on a year long travel, uh, however you define travel, because that's also another conversation. There is different levels of traveling, different levels of uh, uh, internalizing the world around you. But if you are given a year to just be around the world and chat with people, and you come back and you don't write book, don't produce a podcast, don't do anything, uh, you know, afterwards, it doesn't mean that you won't be passing that knowledge to people. I personally, I have learned a lot um, during my travels all around the world. I actually spent uh, two and a half years like that. I wasn't giving that much attention to, to money back then. And, uh, and I was traveling through Americas, both um, uh, north and the south, uh, southern part of uh, uh, the Americas. And I was just chatting with people. And of course, I came back after some time, I published a book. I 
and pursuing my PhD. I'm chatting with people. I'm trying to pass the knowledge that I've learned in single conversations. Really? And I feel that that is the most important thing I can do. Maybe, and that's, well, maybe not a dream. I have more goals than dreams. At some point, I would like to start also my academic academic teaching career. And I would like to have people who like to listen to my perspective and maybe pursue something similar in their lives. Just ba- basically learn as much as possible about the world and the, the role of the technology in that. And then pass that over to, to the next, uh, maybe not generation, but next people. And I feel that's more than most people realize. It doesn't have to be massive volume of viewers or listeners to achieve the same result. Well, that's interesting coming from a technologist because I would have assumed you would want it to scale because we have these options now. I mean, this conversation is a good example. I mean, in a way, on one hand, you are explaining to me something. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there may be a thousand and one people listening to our conversation. So you're telling them as well. So I'm surprised to hear you say you would like to do it one-on-one. I agree. One-on-one is phenomenal. But my own idea would be that to create change, scaling is the best thing. And that's why I love podcasting so much. But there's because also, it, excuse me, go on. but there's also oversaturation. So if you have a certain level of people who are talking about something similar as a concept, and these people already have audience per se, that doesn't mean that you have to jump on the same board. Because, you know, you will be basically following the same steps. You might extend the knowledge in that area. But it would be better if you if you are coming once in a while as a guest. You know, Joe Rogan is a great example. He doesn't have, you know, the the agenda that he's pushing, you know, like as in uh, him being an expert on the professional mixed arts. Uh, he isn't pushing that, you know, through his conversations. He's having random, maybe not random, but he's having... People who are coming over and share the knowledge in their, you know, fields once in a while. And not all of them are podcasters. Not all of them are, you know, authors. Sometimes these are just people who are working in lab. And they are doing nothing else but lab and uh, once in a while some sort of like teaching. And maybe now it's a little bit different. Past, back in the past, he was more like that. And I feel that might be a way because you don't have to jump on the same board to be on the same board. I know, but... Sure, Joe is learning a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff, but so are, well, billions, I would almost, no, millions, hundreds of millions of people are learning along, you know, that their learning journey is is happening, is coexisting with Joe Rogan understanding Mm -hmm. all these things. I know him understanding is an important part of him being able to talk to people, Mm -hmm. but I would have thought um, that you would think that, you can't like having a one-to-one conversation is great, but because it's so easy to scale that conversation, you just upload it to RSS for, for a podcast mm-hmm. feed. You may as well do it because there may be, there may be someone out there who, who has a touch point with yeah. that conversation and it changes their life forever. That's my own personal opinion. I only had one idea like that and I will do it at some point, uh, unless someone else does that. But, uh, um, I need Maybe not the year for like uh, travel, but I need some time to learn a little bit more before I start that. And um, that is more like a documentary project uh, that gives a perspective of what freedom in general is perceived by different types of cultures, different types of people all around the world. Because we talk about freedom a lot. We talk about libertarianism and that's you know maxim maximization of what the concept of freedom can be for for individuals all around uh, the spectrum of the free market years but why not talk about freedom with uh, someone from uh, the border of uh, mongolia and russia they have their perspective of what freedom is as six years old in in england have you know the very feeling that freedom isn't I mean, is connected with him not having uh, orders from his mum or dad. Someone in in Poland, uh, you know, who is like 70 years old, who or like 80 years old, who was fighting the communist regime 
might have a completely different uh, perspective of what freedom is than the libertarian activists from the US in the, in the same age. So I feel that might be a good project, but I'm still only 30 something. So I feel that's a project for someone who is well aware of, uh, you know, a little bit more than happens in the world. I still, I'm, a, I'm still on a learning curve rather than, uh, you know, passing the knowledge only sort of uh, point. Well, I'm, I, I hope people are learning from our conversation. I've been, really enjoyed it. So I love talking about things like this. And I, I, I'm super interested, of course, obviously, in the trajectory on which the world is in particular with regards to communities and how they how they live in the physical world together mm -hmm. uh, so thanks for talking it's been it's been awesome um and sure. i'm looking forward to your speech at capitalismo as well which is why we're in yeah warsaw right now um so i'll, I'll be looking forward to that one it's a great great conversation thanks thanks mm -hmm.